go to. So we're continuing. This is now, uh, we are in part one, chapter one, in the middle of section five of Kitab al-Shifa. For those following along, um, this is the second full paragraph on page 18. So here Qadi Ayyad, he <coughs> quotes from the Quran here, Surah Al-Najm, Surah 53, uh, the first 18 verses, 53, 1 through 18. So he begins by saying, When Najmi Ida Hawa, by the star when it plunges. And the Najm here, the star, according to the exegetes, some of the exegetes is a reference to the Tanzil of the Quran. Tanzil is a reference to the, uh, the revelation of the Quran in continual installments. So there's an Inzal that's mentioned. An Inzal is the Quran being sent down in one shot, as it were, on Laylatul Qadr. Inna anzalnahu. Anzalna. This is the verb. The uh, noun is Inzal. So the Quran descending from the Loh to the Sama'u Dunya. And then from the Sama'u Dunya, there's a Tanzil. Every so often, a few ayat over 23 years would be revealed to the Prophet So this is the opinion of Imam al-Biqa'i and Imam al-Tabari that the meaning of Najm here in 53.1 is a reference to the Tanzil of the Quran, that the ayat are symbolized as Nujum. Another opinion that Qadi Iyad mentions here is that the Najm, and, and this is the opinion of Ja'far ibn Muhammad, is that it is the Prophet وسلم, that he is the Najm, or it's the heart of the Prophet وسلم. And he says, people say similarly, that in the verses, Sama'i wa Tariq wa ma'adraq wa ma'adraq wa ma'adraq wa ma'adraq Surah Tariq, verses 1 through 3, by the heaven and the night star. And what we'll explain to you what is a Tariq, the night star. It is a star of piercing brightness. So he says here that not only is the Najm mentioned in 53.1, a, a name of the Prophet وسلم, or a symbol of the Prophet, so is a Tariq mentioned in Surah Tariq. So one Najmi Ida Hawa, by the star when it descends, this is a reference then to the descension or the descent of the Prophet from Masjidratul Muntaha on Laylatul Isra wal Mi'raj. Wallahu alam. He continues quoting the surah, Ma sahibukum wa ma that your companion is not astray, nor does he err, wa ma yantiku anil hawa nor does he speak from caprice. And the translation here doesn't do it quite justice. No translation really does. It should say, nor does he ever speak from caprice, because when you have ma as a negating particle of a verb that's in the imperfect, the meaning is really never. In huwa illa wahyu yuha. This is only a revelation revealed. And here the Arabic is a, is a negation followed by an affirmation, as we said. In the previous classes, this is a very strong way of negating, of, of making a statement in Arabic. It's like our shahada, la ilaha illallah. In huwa illa, in here means, it is a negating particle. In huwa illa wahyu yuha. It is nothing except revelation. That he only speaks revelation. Allamahu shadidul quwa. Taught to him by one mighty in power. So Imam al-Tabari here says that this is a reference to the Mu'allim of the Prophet وسلم, who is Jibril alayhi salam. And then he continues to quote Surah Al-Najm. ذو مرة فاستوى وهو بالأفق الأعلى ثم دنا فتدلى فكان قاب قوسيني أو أدنى He stood poised while he was on the higher horizon then drew near and hung suspended two bow lengths away or nearer. So here, uh, it's mentioned by Imam al-Zamakhshari, Imam al-Tabari, that this is a reference to one of the two times in which the Prophet ﷺ uh, saw Jibril salam or Jibril salam appeared to him in his uh, actual created form. 
So either Jibreel alayhi salam drew near to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam, or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala drew near to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam. ثُمَّ دَنَا فَتَدَلَّى Then he, the Prophet, drew near and he, Allah, came close. So not in terms of space, time, or distance, if we take the latter um, interpretation that it is a reference to Allah drawing near to the Prophet Sallallahu uh, Alaihi We're not talking about anything to do with any type of physical space or direction. Because Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala transcends space, time, and matter. So then when it says, فَكَانَ قَابَ قَوْسَيْنِ أَوْ أَدَنَا That he was within two bow lengths or even closer. A bow is about six feet, two bow lengths is about twelve feet. So we don't take the literal meaning here. This is majaz. This is figurative. The meaning is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was very, very close in relationship, was close to the Prophet in love. This is similar to the meaning of the Hadith Qudsi we quoted last time. That my servant continues to draw close unto me with his nawafil, his uh, extra credit worship, supererogatory worship, until I love him. So this type of qurb or closeness or proximity, a relational closeness, not a physical closeness. Of course, the Quran says, وَنَحْنُ أَقْرَبُ إِلَيْهِ مِنْ حَبْلِ الْوَرِيدِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, we are closer to the human being than his jugular vein. So this ayah denotes what's known as the imminent deity in, in uh, Western theology. Uh, there's, there's an idea of imminence, closeness of God. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is close to the human being. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has concern for the human being. He's not a cold or reserved or distant deity. He's not a totally transcendent deity, as in like a Aristotelian god or a deist god. There's a hadith, there's multiple, it's in multiple books of hadith actually. Sahih Muslim Abu Dawood and Nasai. Where the Prophet وسلم, he said, Aqrabu ma yakunu al abdin rabbihi wa huwa sajid. Oh, kama qala alayhi salatu wa salam. That the closest a servant can be to his Lord is when he is in sajda. So obviously this has nothing to do with directionality, right? So this idea that, you know, Allah is up in the sky somewhere, right? Um, this idea is grossly anthropomorphic and incorrect, that if I pray on my roof that I'm closer to God or something, the Prophet said whoever is in sajda is in reality closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then he said, فَأَكْثِرُ dua. So make a lot of dua in sajda. In the Hanafi school, uh, we would do this in the nafila prayers not in the fara'id. One of my teachers said that Yunus alayhi salam was closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in reality. And where was Yunus? He was in, he was fit dhulumat. Fanada fit dhulumat. He was in levels of darknesses. In the belly of the whale, in the darkness of the night, the darkness of the ocean, fit dhulumat. But he was in sajda, and he was making dua, he was making tawba, la ilaha illa ant, Subhanaka inni kuntu min al One of my teachers said that Yunus alayhi salam was closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at that moment than an angel is standing in the Baytul, Ma'm, Baytul Ma'mur uh, beyond the seventh heaven or in the seventh heaven because Yunus alayhi salam is in sajda. So the ulama say that then we're saying that at this maqam at this station, the Prophet ﷺ experienced uh, the ru'ya. And he continues to say here, he continues to quote from Surah Al-Najm, فَأَوْحَى إِلَىٰ عَبْدِهِ مَا أَوْحَى We'll come back to this ayah. مَا كَذَبَ الْفُؤَادُ مَا رَآ His heart did not lie about what he saw, or his heart did not lie about what it saw. Imam Al-Qurtubi mentions here that uh, the meaning is, that the Prophet Sallallahu did in fact experience the ru'ya, what's known as the beatific vision of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, that he saw Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. And this is something that's part of our essential creed. Imam Tahawi says in the Aqidah Tahawiyah, he says, الرُّؤْيَةُ to Hakun al ahl jannah that the beatific vision, gazing upon the countenance of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala is, is, uh, is true, 
is a reality for the people of paradise. And then he'll uh, quote the ayat, كَلَّ بَلْ تُحِبُّنَ الْعَاجِلَ وَتَذَرُونَ الْآخِرَ وَجُوهُ يَوْمَئِذٍ نَاظِرَ إِلَى رَبِّهَا نَاظِرَ That on that day, faces will be illuminated, uh, gazing toward their Lord. Surah Yawm al Qiyamah. <clears throat> so Imam al Qurtubi he suggests that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that, that the Prophet sallallahu saw Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with his fu'ad. Ma kathab al fu'ad ma ra'a. The fu'ad here is translated as heart. It's one of the ways of saying heart in Arabic. Sometimes it's translated as the inflamed heart. Fa'ada means to roast or to burn. To inflame, sometimes it's called the emotive heart, right? So when the Prophet ﷺ, when he saw Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you can imagine it was a very extremely powerful emotional experience, but he did not let his emotions over, overpower him, uh, and he remained composed. Another way of translating or thinking about the fu'ad is what's known as the mind's eye. Right? The mind's eye. Not the physical eye, the basar, but the mind's eye. So this is related to the faculty of understanding. This is something that is non-physical. This idea actually goes back to Plato. Right? This idea that you see particulars with your physical eye, but you have to contemplate the essences or the real forms of things with your mind's eye, as he says. So when you see something with your mind's eye, it means you really understand it at a deep level. Right? So if I explain something to you, if I explain, I don't know, I'm not good at math, but if I explain algebra to you and you say, ah, I see, that means you understand. You understand something in your mind's eye. So it indicates a deep type of, of gnosis or ma'rifa. And that tea is too hot. So with this understanding, he experienced an incredible understanding of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the strongest sense of ma'rifah possible for a human being. <coughs> so he experienced the ru'ya, the beatific vision, as we said. How did he see Allah? Bila kefiyah, as Imam Tahawi says. It's a modal. That means there's, there's no way of understanding it. It's without a howness to it. And it's beyond our comprehension. It's not the physical eye, but a type of powerful theophany or experience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in this vein, the ayah is sometimes quoted, لا تدركه الأبصار وهو يدركه الأبصار That no vision can grasp him, yet he grasps all vision. Or, he did see something with his eye, his basar. Um, there's a hadith in Muslim, Abu Dhar, he says that he asked the Prophet ﷺ, Hal ra'ita rabbak? Did you see your Lord? And the Prophet ﷺ responded with, Ra'itu nuran. I saw a light. Now some people understand this response as an affirmative. Uh, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not corporeal. He doesn't have a physical physicality to him. He's not material. So according to this understanding then, uh, he did not see the essence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is in himself, as it were. But rather the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he experienced the greatest possible self-disclosure or tajalli of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It was a veil of light that concealed the divine essence. That is to say, a brilliant created light that symbolized the divine essence or symbolized the divine presence. Allahu alam. We think back to the ayah in Surah Al-A'raf with Musa alayhi salam where he says, Rabbi arini Andur ilayk, O my Lord, show yourself to me so that I might gaze upon you. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Lan tarani, you will not see me, but look at the mountain. I will manifest myself to the mountain, and if the mountain stays put, then you will see me. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, this is ayah 143 of Surah Al-A'raf, 
فلما تجلى ربه للجبل when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, uh, manifested or disclosed himself to the mountain so this doesn't mean that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala came into the physical world right that it was an incredible blinding physical light symbolizing the divine essence this is what manifested according to this understanding and then the mountain was pulverized and Musa fell down thunderstruck and some of the ulama mentioned Imam Zamakhshari, Imam Tabari actually mentioned that Musa died that he actually died right this is mentioned in the tafasir and then he regained his senses meaning he was resurrected after that this is something I think that maybe the medieval Jewish theologians uh, took from Muslim theologians as well. Probably the most famous Jewish theologian, Maimonides. Um, uh, he said that, uh, and it, he, he was a product of you know the, the Muslim world. He was um, uh, he lived in Spain and in Egypt and so on and so forth. He's highly influenced by Imam Al Ghazali and others. But his opinion was that when Musa alayhi salam would go into the tabernacle. In Hebrew, it's called the Mishkan. It's kind of like a portable uh, tent where Musa alayhi salam would go inside and then a brilliant light would manifest in front of him. And this light symbolized the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It was a created light. It's just a symbol of God's presence. It wasn't God, right? Um, this light is called the Shekhinah in Hebrew. This is what Maimonides calls it. Um, the Quran actually says that the Ark of the Covenant, which was an ark that was um, that was built by the ancient Israelites in the Sinai, which housed the original Torah and some of the relics of Musa salam, like his staff was in there. The Quran says that the Ark of the Covenant was endowed with the Shekhinah. The the equivalent is Sakina, right? Sakina uh, in the Ayat of Mulkihi. And yet, yakum at-tabut fihi sakina tu nirabikum. That from the signs of his kingship is that he gave you the tabut, the ark of the covenant, and that within it is sakina, is shechina. And what does this mean? It could mean that there was some sort of light that emanated from the ark of the covenant, uh, a sign of uh, of God's presence, as it were, or tofiq, which was was with Bani Israel uh, at the time. Wallahu <clears throat> alam. There's a hadith Ibn Majah, this is quoted by Ibn Ajiba, Imam Suyuti, and others, that the Prophet وسلم, he said, Hijabuhu nur, the veil of God is light. Lo kashafaha, and that if this veil was removed, his face would burn everything in creation. Right? However, there is another hadith. There's another hadith, and this is in multiple books of a hadith. Ibn Majah, Tirmidhi, Sahih Muslim. That the Prophet وسلم, he quoted from Surah Yunus, verse number 26. Those who do good, the reward is good, and something extra. And the Prophet وسلم, said, this ziyada is the ru'ya is the beatific vision of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he says, when the people of paradise enter paradise, a caller will call out, indeed, there remains a promise with Allah. And then the people will say, have our faces not been illuminated, saved from the fire, and admitted to paradise? And then the Prophet said, for yukshaful hijab, then the veil is lifted. The veil is actually lifted. فَوَاللَّهِ مَا أَعْطَاهُمُ اللَّهُ شَيْئًا أَحَبَّ إِلَيْهِ مِنَ النَّظَرِ إِلَيْهِ And then he said, for by God, nothing is more beloved to them, nothing that Allah gave them is more beloved to them than glancing at him, than the vision of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the people of paradise will see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with the veil removed. How is this possible? Allahu alam. Bila kefiya. There's no howness to it. There's no way we can possibly understand this. But this is a reality. Again, as Imam al Tahawi says. So this is the meaning here, going all the way back to Surah Al Najm, according to many of the ulama, uh, that 
ما كذب الفؤاد وما رأى. Again, his heart did not lie about what it saw or he saw. It continues. Will you dispute with him about what he saw? Indeed, he saw him another time by the low tree of the boundary, Sidratul Muntaha, right, which is in the seventh heaven, near which is the garden of refuge, Jannatul Ma'wa. When what covered the low tree covered it, his eye did not swerve nor sweep aside. Ma zagad basaru wa ma tagha. Laqad ra'a min ayati rabbihi al-kubra. He saw one of the greatest signs of his Lord. <clears throat> so Qadi Iyad, he mentions here, what Allah disclosed to him of his unseen dominion of the Jabarut and the wonders of the angelic realm, the Malakut, cannot be expressed in words. And the human intellect would not be able to withstand hearing even the least part of it. Allah indicates it by indirect allusion and reference, which shows the esteem in which the Prophet is held. Allah says, فَأَوْحَى إِلَىٰ عَبْدِهِ مَا أَوْحَى Which means that then Allah revealed to his servant whatever he revealed. What was that which he revealed? Some of the ulama mentioned that a few things. They say that the end of Al-Baqarah was revealed to the Prophet called Khawatim Al-Baqarah, the last two ayahs of Al-Baqarah, which contains our essential creed, Aman al-Rasul, this is how it begins. It, it contains our essential creed. These were revealed to the Prophet when he was at the Sidratul Muntaha in the seventh heaven. And Jibreel السلام, was not there. It was only the Prophet So these verses were placed directly into his heart by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala without an angelic mediation. Also, the ulama mentioned the prayer was made fard during this time, five times a day. There's a, a wa'ad of Jannah that was given to the Prophet and his nation, the promise of paradise, and other things. Um, as Qadi Iyad says here, secrets of the Jabarut and Malakut. Ibn Ajiba mentions this also with regard to the, the final ayah in that sequence. لَقَدْ رَأَى مِنْ آيَاتِ رَبِّهِ الْكُبْرَى He saw one of the greatest signs of his Lord. Ibn Ajiba says, these are secrets, asrar, of the Malakut and Jabarut. These are celestial realms or worlds beyond the mulk, beyond the perceptible world. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> Ordinary understanding is not able to grasp the details of what was revealed. So then he says, in this ayah, Allah alludes to the Prophet's state of total purity and his protection from harm during the journey, and he's talking about the Laylatul Isra wal Mi'raj, he affirmed the purity of his heart, tongue, and eye. His heart by the words, ma kathab al fu'ad ma ra'a, the purity of his tongue by, wa ma yantiku anil hawa, he never speaks from his caprice, and his eye, ma zagh al basaru wa ma tagha, his eye did not swerve nor sweep aside. Purity of heart, tongue, and eye. If we can guard the purity, if we can make our hearts, tongues, and eyes pure, then we'll be in a good state, inshallah ta'ala. <clears throat> okay. Sorry. And then he, uh, he quotes now Qadi Iyad. He moves to Surah Al-Takwir. This is Surah 81. And he quotes uh, uh, from 15, ayah 15 to 25, kind of the middle of the surah. Allah says, uh, this translation says, No, I swear by those who slip away, the runners, those who hide themselves, by the night swarming, by the morning sighing. Innahu laqawlu rasulin kareem. This is the jawab al qasam. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran, oftentimes, especially in the Meccan surah, he'll take an oath by something, and uh, that's called the qasam. And then he'll give the sort of um, the, uh, the, 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 the statement of oath. Uh, like if I say, for example, I swear to Allah, that's called an oath, but you're waiting for the, what's known as the jawab al qasam. I say, well, I prayed fajr. I swear to Allah, I prayed fajr. That's called the jawab al qasam. So the jawab al qasam here, innahu laqawlu rasulin kareem. 
that truly this is the word of a noble messenger. It continues, the quwwatin inda dhil arshi makin, having power secure with the Lord of the throne, muta'in thumma amin, obeyed and trusted. Then it continues, your companion is not possessed, he truly saw him on the clear horizon. So Ali ibn Isa al-Rumani, another said that the noble messenger وسلم, is Muhammad وسلم. So all these attributes are his. Others, say, others said it is Jibreel alayhi salam. So these qualities are his. He truly saw him means that he, Jibreel, saw Muhammad وسلم. It is said that it is uh, said that it means that he, Muhammad وسلم, saw his Lord. It is said that it means he saw Jibreel in his true form. There's a difference of opinion about what does it mean that he truly saw him on the clear horizon? Some of the ulama say that, again, this is a reference to the ru'ya, the beatific vision that the Prophet وسلم, experienced uh, on the later to Isra al Mi'raj. That is something that's going to happen, inshallah, for all the believers that make it to Jannah. There's even an opinion that everyone on the Yom al Qiyamah will experience the ru'ya. Everybody will see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be la kafiya without any howness, but then the kuffar will suddenly be veiled from him and they'll never experience that again. Oh, the Iyad, he then he moves to Surah Al Qalam, Surah 68. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Noon is one of those uh, letters, the huruful muqatta'at, that nobody really knows the meaning. Of course, the ulama have their opinions, but it's always Allahu Alam. A popular opinion here, Ibn Kathir, Imam al Qurtubi, is that Noon here stands for Nur, light. Allahu Alam. Wal qalami wa ma yasturun. By the pen and what they inscribe. Ma anta bi ni'mati rabbika bi majnoon. You are not by the blessing of your Lord a man possessed. Inna laka la ajran ghayra mamnoon. You shall surely have an unfailing reward or wage. And surely you are possessed of mighty nature. Or, I mean, that's an interesting translation. Verily, you dominate magnificent character. Something like you stand on monumental ethics. Something like that. <coughs> so he said, Allah swears by uh, this great oath um, that his chosen prophet was free of what the unbelievers ascribe to him in their disdain and rejection of him. He brings joy to him and increases him in hope, uh, and he addresses him gently, saying, you are not by the blessing of your Lord a man possessed. This shows the greatest respect and is an example of the highest degree of adab in conversation. Then he tells him that we will have eternal blessings and an immeasurable reward with him one that can be counted and will not make him in any way indebted using the words, you shall surely have an unfailing wage. Then he praises him for the gifts he has given him. <clears throat> he guides him to himself and confirms that to emphasize his praiseworthiness. He says, وَإِنَّكَ لَعَلَى خُلُوكٍ عَظِيمٍ So it's very interesting here in the Arabic that the, uh, the word ala in Arabic, uh, this is called a ظَرْفُ makan. It's a spatial adverb. And usually, if you say ala, the word that follows it should be something concrete, right? Like a table or a desk, like al qalamu ala, ala al maktab, right? The pen is on the table. But in rhetoric, if the word that follows ala uh, is abstract, like khuluk means ethics or character, this denotes what's known as tamakun or mastery. So, in nakala ala khuluk, you master khuluk azim. Azim is added as, a, as an uh, adjective. Magnificent character. A standard of character. It is said that these wor words refer to the Quran. And the translator has a note here that Aisha was asked about the character of the Prophet. And she said, Kana khulukuhu al Quran. That his character was the Qur'an. He is an embodiment of the kitab. The, the word made flesh, as it were. <coughs> Others say it refers to Islam. And it is said that they simply mean noble nature. 
It is also said that the meaning of them is that the Prophet ﷺ has no aspiration except Allah. Then he, he says, Qadi Iyad, he says, then Allah continues the surah by consoling him for what they said about him, by promising him that they will be punished. He threatens them with his words. Uh, you shall see, and they will see, which of you is afflicted. Surely your Lord knows very well those who have gone astray from his way, and he knows very well those who are guided. Then after praising him, Allah censures his enemies, makes known their bad character, and enumerates their faults. Then he follows this with his bounty and his helping the Prophet. He mentions some ten or so censured qualities. So um, this is uh, very common in Semitic rhetoric. It's very common in the Quran. This idea of binarity is what is called in English rhetoric or double portraits or tibak, this sort of juxtaposition of opposite ideas. Uh, so juxtaposed with the ayah describing the Prophet's beautiful character uh, is the mukaddibin, those who are uh, denying the Prophet wasallam and their character traits. Right? So you have khuluq azim or khuluq mahmud, praiseworthy character, juxtaposed with khuluq madhmum, uh, blameworthy character or bad character. So when you read... Uh, these, when we read these descriptions of the character of, uh, of those who are um, uh, rejecting the Prophet Wasallam, the Prophet's character is exactly the opposite of this. It is juxtaposed against this. So Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala says, Do not obey those who reject al-mukathibin, the people of takthib, right? the people who rebel against God. And they're proud of it. They call these people today anti-theists. They're not just atheists. This is someone who says, there might be a God, but I don't want to obey him anyway. Anti-theist. Right? People of takvib. Kedhabat thamudu bi They hope that you will try to conciliate with them. And they will try to conciliate with you. <clears throat> or another way of translating this, they hope that you will try to compromise with them and they will try to compromise with you. So the Prophet ﷺ did have a conciliatory nature. He compromised uh, at Hudaybiyah uh, with the treaty. You know, the Muslims wrote Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, and then an envoy from the Mushrikeen in Mecca, uh, Suhail ibn Amr, he came and he said that, what is Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim? Who is ar-Rahman ar-Rahim? These are the names of Allah. He said, I've never heard of these. Change it to Allahumma bismika. And the Prophet said, okay, no problem. And they kept reading the document, and it says, Muhammad Rasulullah. And he said, I don't believe you're Rasulullah. Right? So let's make it more secular. Let's write Ibn Abdullah, because we both agree on that. So the Prophet said, okay, no problem. Right? We can compromise on that. So he said, Sayyidina Ali, show me where it says Rasulullah. He says, right here. And he said to Ali, erase it. And, Prophet, and Ali said, no, I'm never going <laughs> to erase it. So Sayyidina Ali, he disobeys the Prophet وسلم, out of respect for the Prophet وسلم. So he says, show me where it is. It's right here. So he, he erased it himself. Right? So he compromised, but he did not compromise his theology and ethics. There was no compromise when it comes to theology and ethics. Right? Remember the man who came to the Prophet وسلم, said, Ya Rasulullah, قُلْ لِي فِي الْإِسْلَامِ قَوْلًا لَا أَسَلُ عَنْهُ أَحَدًا غَيْرَكَ Tell me something special about Islam that only you can tell me. Say, I believe in Allah and be firm upon that. Istiqama. Stand firm upon that. Be a principled person. Don't be a wishy washy person. Right? <clears throat> of course, Ibn Hisham mentions that early in the Meccan period, um, they tried threatening the Prophet. They tried sort of buying him out, right? You know, we'll give you, we'll make you the king, and we'll give you this and that, and, uh, and none of these things, none of these, none, none of these things work because the Prophet would not compromise in these areas. So then he continues to describe the mukaddibin. He calls them every mean swearer, or a better, a better translation, vile oath monger. 
So the tafsir says that they're always swearing by Allah's name, but they're always lying. They're, all, they're full of wallahis. Wallahi, wallahi, wallahi. But you can't trust anything they're saying. They're always lying. Backbiter going about with slander. So they spread gossip. They love scandal. Hinder of good, guilty aggressor. They're harsh, they're negative, they're immature. Right? The Prophet ﷺ said it is from a person's muru'ah or uh, maturity that he can hear the opinion of another man and he won't interrupt him even when he disagrees. This is something that is just lost now. People are just so easily offended. They're, they have a term for it. They're triggered. Now in colleges, you know, they have these sort of safe spaces they go to. If they feel like they've been offended by some, some opinion they don't like, they go to these little rooms and they play with Play-Doh. They play video games. This is relatively new. I, didn't, I don't remember having safe spaces when I was an, an undergrad in the early 2000s. But that's what's happening. <clears throat> and then coarse and rude, we said that. Moreover, ignoble because he has wealth and sons. So this is a type of person who thinks that because he has a lot of children or he has a lot of money, that he's better than everybody else. Right? Um, elsewhere in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Yawma la yanfa'u malun wa la banun. Then on the day of judgment, uh, children or sons, children in general, uh, or wealth, will not benefit anyone. إِلَّا مَنْ أَتَ اللَّهَ بِقَلْبٍ سَلِيمٍ Except the one who brings to God a sound heart. Then it's possible for your wealth and children to benefit you. Um, because you spent in the way of Allah and your children make dua for you, so on and so forth. And then he finishes this section here in Surah Qalam. When our signs are recited to him, they say these are fairy tales of the ancients. Right? <clears throat> like even like even today, you'll have people, you know, the flood, you know, the flood of Noah, the Exodus. This is just mythology, and where is their historical proof? You know, the Quran says, "Watamat karimatu Rabbika sidqan wa adla," that. The word of your Lord is fulfilled in truth and in justice. In the 1980s, the tomb of a very high-ranking Semitic official was discovered in a place called Everis, which uh, is in, in Egypt, in northern Egypt. It used to, be, used to be called Goshen. According to the Torah, at least, this is where the Israelites lived. This is where Yaqub, alayhi salam, made hijrah to, this is where his 12 sons lived. There was a tomb found there um, that many Egyptologists, like David Roll, I mean, these are not people that are necessarily religious, they're very secular scholars, David Ayling, Charles Ayling, they say that this is probably the tomb of Joseph. This is their opinion. In 1998, there were these two brilliant geophysicists at uh, Columbia, Ryan and Pittman, and they found exactly uh, where the flood occurred, when it occurred, and how it happened. Is incredible work. Uh, they actually wrote a book. It's called Noah's Flood, the new scientific discoveries about the event that changed history. It agrees with the Quranic narrative 100%. It's really amazing. The theory is called the, uh, the the Black Sea Deluge theory. I, um, I highly uh, encourage you to look it up because this is something that's always attacked by like atheists or secular people, right? That it'd be these stories they have no historical basis, so on and so forth. But you know, th this was th this book was published in 1998. This is something relatively new. So the word of thy Lord finds fulfillment. It takes an amount of trust, a bit of trust. <coughs> but this is what this is what they the mukhadibin. These are just fairy tales, you know. What do, what do you what do you believe in this stuff? This type of thing, you know. We're scientific, right? We're scientific. 
yet they believe that there's something called dark matter. <laughs> that's, that's sort of the catch-all for them. You know, like the Jupiter makes orbits around the sun, but the math doesn't quite work for them. Jupiter's too big. What keeps Jupiter in its orbit consistently? Dark matter. What is that? It's just something that's out there. It's, it's a, fills in the gaps of the ignorance. Right. The universe is expanding and it's increasing in its expansion. How is that happening? Dark energy. What is that? Just trust us. It's dark energy. Why should I trust you? Anyway. <clears throat> Allah concludes these words with the real threat that, that their misery will be complete and their total ruin by saying, we will brand him upon the muzzle, the khurtum, will brand him on the nose. So the nose is sort of the, the most apparent feature on the face, right? So most of the ulama believe this is an idiomatic expression, that it means that Allah will expose people of vice and corruption. He'll expose the people of rebellion for what there, it really is. Right? And they'll be proven wrong eventually. <clears throat> Okay, so that's, let's see what we're doing. Any questions or <coughs> comments? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the, the standard exegesis here is that the, the recorders, the inscribers, are the mana'ika, right? That it's an oath, taking the oath by the recording angels. That their pen is recording um, the events of the world, the deeds of humanity. So Allah is taking an oath by the angels. Wallahu alam. There may be other meanings. There definitely are other meanings. Others say the qalam is a reference to the first thing that Allah created. There's a hadith like this. The first thing that Allah created is the pen. Right? There's a sound hadith, I believe. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So then uh, Allah said to the pen, Uktub, write. And then it started writing the history of existence. And that's why some of the traditions mentioned that when the Prophet ﷺ was beyond the Siddilatul Muntaha, he heard a scratching sound. And it was the pen writing um, the history of existence. Wallahu alam. Yeah. There appear to be different angels. They're assigned to each person. Yeah. Allahu Akbar. Inshallah, that's correct. Yeah. So that on the Yom Al Qiyamah, people receive their kitab. It's mentioned in the Quran. Kiram and Katibin is mentioned, the recording angels. And then the kitab, um, the believers in the right hand, the unbelievers in the left hand or behind the back. Of course, we want an edited version of that kitab. We said last time, one of the names of Allah is Al-Afu, the one who erases. <laughs> so the things in the kitab, you're like, oh, I don't want to look at this chapter. <laughs> and there's nothing there. It's gone because the Tawbah was accepted. And Allah just effaced it. It's gone. Yeah, there's an ayah in the Quran like this. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know the left of the, the ayah, but there's something like this in, in definitely in the Quran. Yeah. Yeah. I have to look it up, inshallah. Let's see. Uh, so, section six now. 
is concerning Allah's addressing the Prophet with compassion and generosity. So he begins by quoting Surah Taha. Allah says Taha. So this is usually taken to be one of the names of the Prophet Imam al-Razi mentions that Jafar al-Sadiq, Jafar al-Sadiq is the same one who said that Yasin is Yasayid. He mentions that Jafar al-Sadiq says it refers to the purity, Tahara, of the Ahlul Bayt. And others say that the meaning is Ya Tahir, one of the names of the Prophet ﷺ. We did not send down the Qur'an upon you in order for you to be distressed. It's better than wretched. Distressed is a better word. <clears throat> so he says it is said that, so I mentioned that as one of the names of the Prophet ﷺ. One of the meanings also according to Ibn Abbas is, oh man, Taha in the Meccan dialect. It's mentioned by Ibn Abbas, at least something attributed to Ibn Abbas. That one of the meanings of Taha is, oh man, or oh reader, right? So um, uh, Ibn Hisham relates the conversion of Sayyidina Umar, right? We know the story of Sayyidina Umar that he had a sword and he was going to Dar al-Arkam to kill the Prophet Sallallahu that was his intention. And then a man named Nu'aym, a secret Muslim, sees him and says, where, where are you going? He said, I'm going to go kill him. And he said, what about your own household? So he had to buy time for the Prophet Sallallahu to go tell them. So Sayyidina Umar goes to his house and he can, he can hear a scribe named Khabab reciting from Surah Taha, right? And his sister Fatima and her husband Zayd are inside. And of course, we know the story. He busts down the door. They get into a tussle. His sister is injured. She tries to break up the two men. And she's like elbowed or punched in the face or something. And there's blood. So Omar feels bad. So they give him the, the scroll and he reads it. Um, and he reads Surah Taha. Taha man zanna alayka al-Quran li tashqa. This sort of speaks to him directly. Oh man, we did not send this Quran in order for you to be distressed. And then he read, Hal ataka hadithu Musa. And Sayyidina Umar's temperament is very similar to Moses, <laughs> according to that Prophet. They're very similar. So there's a very, like, sort of, um, what do you call it? Um, like a, uh, a passage that was sort of tailored for him personally, that appealed to his heart. And by the way, the oldest, um, the oldest manuscript in the world, Quran manuscript in the world, is contains Surah Taha. It's four pages long, and it's dated to right in the middle of the Meccan period. This could be the very uh, manuscript that, that Sayyidina Umar was actually reading. It's possible. It's called the Birmingham Manuscript. It's in um, University of Birmingham in, in England. Um. It is also said that it is the imperative of the verb to tread, and that the ha indicates the earth, i.e., stand on the earth with both feet and do not tire yourself by standing on one foot. This is why Allah says, we have not sent down the Quran upon you for you to be dis uh, distressed. He sent down the ayat when the Prophet used to make himself stay awake and exhaust himself standing in prayer through the night. al rabi ibn Anas said that the Prophet prayed, when the prophet prayed, he used to stand on one leg and then the other. So he was like, not like stand on one leg. He would rotate or shift his weight from foot to foot. Um, so that Allah revealed to him, Taha, i.e., stand with both feet upon the earth, O Muhammad. We have not sent down the Quran upon you for you to be distressed. In any case, it is clear that all this indicates honor and excellent behavior. Imam Qurtubi mentioned something similar to that. Of course, the hadith in Tirmidhi, Kana sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, yusalli hatta tarimu qadamah. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to pray until his feet would swell. Right? So don't exhaust yourself with this worship. Or, according to the ulama, it is a reference to the Prophet's grief and incredible concern for the Meccans when most of them initially disbelieved in his message. Like we said last, last week, the fact that they're not believing him, even though he had a stellar reputation, is something that is just mind-boggling to him. Like, why don't you believe me now? Who else could bring you this message and you'd believe? So this is why the Quran was, is almost like a sense of his distress, that this is sort of what sort of made this attitude towards me. So Allah is saying to him, uh, we did not send the Quran down for that purpose. In this vein, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Kahf, ayah number 6, فَلَعَلَكَ بَاخِئٌ نَفْسَكَ عَلَىٰ أَثَارِهِمْ 
إِنَّمْ يُؤْمِنُوا بِهَذَا الْحَدِيثِ أَسَفَا Perhaps you will consume yourself out of grief for them if they do not believe in this message. Uh, and then she says, i.e., kill yourself. But kill doesn't mean like he's going to kill himself literally. It means like Imam al-Razi says, like utterly exhaust himself with grief. To be so just overcome with grief, exhausted with grief, because his people don't believe in him. <clears throat> so Allah says, had we so willed, we would have sent down on them from heaven a sign so that their necks would remain humble to it. In the same vein, Allah says, Proclaim what you are commanded and turn away from the idolaters. We are enough for you against the mockers. And here the mockers are the mustahzi'un. That's the word in Arabic. Istihza. The mockers of the Prophet. There's a special group, especially bad group, from the kuffar, right? That are called the mustahzi'un. These are people who didn't just disbelieve in the Prophet like before the Fatha Mecca, Abu Sufyan did not believe in the Prophet Abu Ibn al Amr Ibn al As did not believe in the Prophet right? But they are not from the Mustahzi'un. The Mustahzi'un are those who mock the Prophet right? Uh, so these are people like Abu Jahal, Abu Lahab, Uqba ibn Abi Mu'ayt, uh, Al As ibn Wa'il, Ubay ibn Khalaf, Umayyah ibn Khalaf. None of these men became Muslim. None of them became Muslim. They were either killed at Badr or they died from diseases. Every single one of them was Stahzi'un. None of them were guided to Islam. But people that were fierce opponents of the Prophet, like Abu Sufyan ibn Harb, tried to kill the Prophet many times, but he did not mock the Prophet. Right? This is where the ulama say that, that mocking the Prophet uh, is, is tantamount to kufr. Um, and also breaching adab with al bayt of the Prophet ﷺ puts one in danger of a su' al khatima a bad ending, right? Because of what happened to the mustahzi'un. And your lineage will not help you because Abu Lahab is Bani Hashim and he's the uncle of the Prophet ﷺ. And then he says, we know that your breast is constricted by what they say. It's an idiomatic expression. He feels a tightness, a distress. You feel a tightness in your chest because of what they're saying. But then Allah says, messengers before you were mocked, and I gave the unbelievers a respite. Then I seized him. I seized them. And Allah set his mind at ease and excused him, saying, فَتَوَلَّ عَنْهُمْ فَمَا أَنْتَ بِمَلُومْ Turn away from them, you are not to be blamed. وَذَكِّرْ فَإِنَّ ذِكْرَةً فَعُلْ مُؤْمِنِينَ And remind them, for the reminder, meaning the Qur'an, benefits the believers. Similarly, Allah says, وَاسْبِرْ لِحُكْمِ رَبِّكْ فَإِنَّكَ بِأَعْيُنِنَا Be patient under the judgment of your Lord. You are before our eyes. Or be patient, study Qur'an says, Be patient with the judgment of thy Lord, for thou art before our eyes. What does that mean? I asked one of my teachers, can you translate to that to me in, in California English? And he says, the meaning is, Relax, I got your back. <laughs> Relax. I'm backing you up. Section 7. Let's see how we're doing on time. It's five minutes till eight. Any questions or comments? Section 7, we'll start it and we'll end when I hear the adhan, inshallah. Concerning Allah's praise of him and his numerous excellent qualities, Allah says, وَإِذْ أَخَذَ اللَّهُ مِثَاقَ النَّبِيِّينَ Allah made a pact with the prophets. This is called the prophetic covenant. It's mentioned in Surah Ali Imran, Surah number 3, verse 81, 381. The prophetic covenant. A covenant is an agreement. Stipulating, I have given you something of the book, kitab and hikmah, wisdom. Then a messenger will come to you, confirming what you have. You are to believe in him and help him. Allah asked, do you acknowledge that? 
Do you take on that burden of my pact on that basis? They said, Aqrarna. We acknowledge that. Then Allah says, Fashhadu wa ana ma'akum mina shahideen. Bear witness, and I am among the witnesses. Abul Hassan al Qabisi said that Allah singled out the Prophet ﷺ for an excellence which he did not give to anybody else. He clearly states this in the ayah. The commentators say that Allah made this pact by means of revelation. He did not send any prophet without mentioning and describing the Prophet ﷺ to him. The pact stipulated that if any prophet met the Prophet ﷺ, he must believe in him. It is said that the pact entailed telling them their people about him, and that it stipulated that they must explain this and describe him to those coming after them. Allah's words, Ja'akum, Ja'akum Rasulun, then a messenger will come, is in fact addressed to the people of the book, contemporary with the Prophet. Now the next ayah says, فَمَن تَوَلَّا بَعْدَ ذَلِكْ فَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْفَاسِقُونَ That whoever turns away after this, they are iniquitous. Imam Razi and Qurtubi say this ayah must refer, the previous ayah must refer then to the prophets and their followers because a prophet would never turn away uh, and become iniquitous. But their followers might, and they have. So this is just one of the many mithaq, the covenants mentioned in the Quran. There's another covenant, it's called the uh, primordial covenant, mithaq alast. This is uh, mentioned in Surah Al-A'raf, verse 172, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asked all of humanity before he created their physical bodies, perhaps in some pre-somatic uh, spiritual state where he was questioning our ruh, our wah, our souls. Alastu bi rabbikum, am I not your Lord? And we answered, bala shahidna. And this is one of the reasons why, according to the ulama, the Quran is called a dhikr, the reminder, right? That that latent within our human nature, our fitra, uh, is, is this recognition, recognition, right? To, to re know something, uh, to re know our ubudiyah, or to remember the ubudiyah to the Rabb, right? It's why people argue, natural law theorists argue, that everybody, if they think clearly with reason, with their aql, they must come to the conclusion that there is a creator of the universe, and it's a singular creator. Those are the sort of effects of the covenant, Yom Alast. So I guess we'll stop, inshallah. It's nearly eight. So next time we'll continue, inshallah. Jazakallah khairan. Wa sallallahu alayhi wa muhammadin wa alihi wa sahabihi wa sallam. Alhamdulillah. Yeah, good to see you.